Okay, how's everyone doing today? This is Derek Brax, and I'm here to give you some weekly wisdom. Here to give you some weekly wisdom. I hope today finds everyone in the best uh, health, uh, with strength mentally, physically, spiritually, all of the above. Okay. For the next, for the next um, several chapters, we will be dealing with, um, Abraham. Okay. And I, I want you to understand that the running theme with this character, Abram to Abraham will be a battle between, uh, the flesh and the spirit, the physical and the spiritual, the, the carnal and the spiritual. OK, um, but it is very important to understand that even though we are talking about the man who will later become Abraham at this specific moment, we are dealing with Abram. Now, does that make a difference? Of course it does. OK, why? Because there is a need to always understand um, the before and and after events of the Bible. Okay. Now in this situation, uh, there is a name change that will happen. So we have, um, Abram before and Abraham afterwards. Okay. Now where the actual, um, change takes place is most important. Okay. So recapping, um, just as in Genesis 11, um, I explained that even though we are dealing with the ancestors of Abraham, those people were not the people of God. OK, therefore, thinking that the entire line of Shem was righteous would be an error because we have to understand that after God blessed Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, uh, the next person that he called uh, was Abraham, Abram. The next person that he dealt with was Abram. So there is a gap of approximately nine generations uh, before God speaks to anyone else. In Genesis 11 and 31, and Terah took Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, where they came to Haran and dwelt there. So you have Terah and his children will be uh, Abraham, Nahor, Haran, and Sarah. Haran has three children, Milka, Iska, and Lot. And what, what we're seeing here is that Abraham is married to married to Sarah and Nahor is married to Milka. Please understand that. 
According to Genesis 20 and 12, Sarah is the sister of Abraham. See that? And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Okay. So let me explain this to you. This is another case of before and after. This is before the laws of Moses, which forbid marriages of close relatives. Okay. We see that in Leviticus 18 and 19 right there. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she is born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness shall thou not uncover. Okay, we're talking about sex, we're talking about marriage. Okay, so remember at this point that um, Abraham is chosen, right? So it is just like Adam and Eve. All right. Once something righteous is established, that is the best way to reproduce righteousness. OK. And this is why the people of God ought to marry one another, because God wants a righteous seed. We find that in Malachi 2 and 15. God wants his people to marry one another so that it reproduces something godly. OK. So until Israel became a nation, the people of God. Uh, were few. All right. And as they increased in numbers, by the time they left Egypt, the population had grown and God established the forbidden sex through their through the Mosaic law. OK, so I hope that that's that's clear for you to understand. So this is why in this time with, with Abram, it was OK for him to marry his sister again. And Tara took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law. And notice, Sarah is not considered to be uh, his daughter because why? Her marriage to Abram was greater than that. So his her marriage to Abram uh, identify, identified her as Abram's wife. Okay? And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. This is where we're going to pick up this week. So we're getting into Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. And remember, Abraham's journey is going to be a struggle between the flesh and the spiritual. OK, so let's get into the scriptures. Verse one says, and the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Now, this is this uh, is a very informative verse. God is telling Abram to leave everything that he knows and to trust him. OK, because notice God did not tell him where where he was going. And also, if. Abraham's people were righteous. Understand this. If Abraham's people were righteous, God would not have told him to leave them for a fresh start, for a new beginning. Okay. Just, just store that in your mind. Okay. Getting back to, uh, uh, verse two. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. So God said, I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a, a blessing. You're going to be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So he will bless them that bless Abram. He will curse them that curse Abram. And in Abram shall all families be blessed. Okay. Now, it's important to understand that every um, every blessing that we experience that we receive is because of Abraham. OK, who this man will later on become to be. OK, now this is special. Please understand that this is something that is very special. But let us analyze this for a second. OK, because God told Abram to leave everything that he knew. 
his country, his father's house, uh, and that to go to a place that he would show him. Now watch this. Here's what we understand. Abram did not immediately obey God. Okay. Remember, remember I said his struggle was between the physical and the spiritual, right? Watch this. Let's go to Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter seven says seven and two. And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, this is Stephen speaking, Hawken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And he said unto them, unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from thence when his father was dead he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell are you seeing this so God appeared to Abram before Tara took them took the entire family Okay, before Terah took his entire household to Haran. Okay, this is what we covered in, in, in Genesis uh, 11 and 31. However, Abram did not obey God and neither did God deal with him anymore until he obeyed. So God called him out. He didn't leave. So God didn't deal with him again until he obeyed. And this happened to be after his father died. So after his father died is when Abram obeyed. Okay. And this is when God started dealing with him again. Okay. But remember, this is very important to understand that we are dealing with Abram and not Abraham. Okay. Before and after. All right. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. See, God didn't change what he, what he, what he told him, what he asked him, what he requested of him. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, what you, what you should understand about this is that Abram is being tested. Okay. This is the beginning of something new. This is the beginning of a new thing, okay? Um, because there is now a need to be changed from the old life of sin to a new life, okay? Now, how old was Abram when, when God called him out? When he finally obeyed? He was 75 years old, okay? Verse 5, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan. They came. So Abraham was finally obedient and he ended up in Canaan. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Shechem unto the plain of Moray. And the Canaanite was then in the land. All right. Sikkim, Shechem is going to be the region of Palestine. Okay. And the plain here is going to be a tree. It refers to a tree. And Moray names actually means teacher. He stopped at this tree as soon as he entered into this land. I, I think that it's important to notice that, uh, to, to mention that, um, that, that they're already, that Abram is already in the land of Canaan. Okay. So, oh, and, and you know what? Let me say this. Why did Abraham stop at this tree? Okay. The significance of him stopping at this tree is because in that time, the people were known to use things of nature like trees and stuff like that for places to hear from their gods, lowercase g-o-d-s, okay? So 
this seems to be what Abram did, I guess, hoping to hear again from, from God. Okay. And this is why I guess the tree is called teacher. Now, remember, these are the, these are the early stages of God calling Abram and he is not totally familiar with God and his ways. So one thing that it's important to realize is that he does not have the relationship element down yet. Okay. So, and again, this is Abram, not Abraham. However, God still met Abram where he was in that mindset where he was. God still met him there. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. This is a, um, a testament of, of who uh, of the character of, of Abram. God is promising to give this land to his seed. Let me give you another reference. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 7. Um, verse 5. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child, no child. So what, we, what we're understanding here is God is telling Abram that this land, the same land that you're in, I'm going to give this to your, your, um, your descendants. But now remember, Abraham was already 75 years old. He's past 75 years old when he finally obeyed God and left. Okay. Sarah, his wife, is barren. Okay. But I want you to notice uh, the actions of Abram. He dedicated the place to God. All right. He dedicated this place to God. All right. Verse eight. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of of the Lord. Now Bethel later will will become um the name will mean the house of God. And high happens to be the second place that Israel conquered when they uh invaded the land of Canaan. I don't know the significance of that if there is a a, a significance or relevance of that uh pertaining to how, you know, it being that this is the second place with with Abram and also the second place that, that Israel conquered. Okay. Verse nine, verse nine says, and Abram journeyed going on still toward the South. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah, his wife, behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. So it means that she was, she was, she was beautiful. Okay. But now what we're going to understand is that, uh, Abram going back into the physical here. Okay. Abram is going back into the physical. So he's saying that I, I know, Sarah, I know that you're a beautiful woman and he's going to ask her to lie for him. Okay. Verse 12 says, therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. But they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake and my soul shall live because of thee. 
You see, he's asking Sarah to lie and say that she is his sister. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Verse 16. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servant and maid servant and he and she asses and camels. So Pharaoh gave Abram sheep, oxen, he asses, men servant, maid servant, she asses and camels because of Sarah. Now understand this, even though Abram is receiving these things because of his lie, right? When he told Sarah to say that, that, um, that she's his sister, right? He actually told him that that was his sister, right? It does not trump what God promised. Remember verse 12 and three says, and I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse them that curse thee. Okay. So the blessing to Pharaoh, watch this, was the warning, the plague before he married Sarah or before he had sex with Sarah and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So God has to make sure that he does not contaminate this woman, right? Because the future promise has to come through her. Please understand that. Verse 18 and Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? But Pharaoh said, what, what you did? Why you didn't tell me she was your wife? That's what he's asking. Why said is thou, she is my sister. Why did you tell me she was your sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now, therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. See that? Why said is thou, she is my sister. So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now, therefore, behold thy wife and take her and go thy way. Well, why did you tell me she was your sister? And now I'm able to take her to be my wife. This is what Pharaoh is asking him. So he's saying that, but you know what? Take your wife, take everything that I gave you and, and leave. Okay. Now, remember, remember Genesis 20 and 12 says, uh, and yet indeed she is my sister. This is Abram at another point. Uh, this is Abraham at this point. And yet indeed she is my sister talking about Sarah, right? She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. But once again, just like with Terah, it is mentioned that, that Sarah is Abram's wife instead of his daughter, because that is of more importance. So, uh, him being her being Abram's wife, trumps her being his daughter. The same thing is here. Once Abram married Sarah, she is no longer his sister. Okay. And what, because some, somebody might say that, okay, well, he didn't lie. But actually, he did lie because what makes it be a lie is that he intended to be deceptive. That's what makes it a lie. OK. Verse 20. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So Pharaoh sent him away with everything, all right? And even though we are dealing with Abram, he is still being protected by God. If Pharaoh would have taken the gifts back, 
it would have brought a curse on Pharaoh. So what we have to understand is that, that because that means that that blessing that he had, that the, the blessings that he had given Abraham would have disqualified him for what God did for him. And there would have been consequences for his actions concerning Abram. Okay. So here's the thing. We have to understand that, um, that God makes the difference wherever you are in life with God, there is protection and there is a covering, but what is the big picture? Is spiritual life or death. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with rewards and consequences. Okay. So what I want to do um, today is I want to pray for um, those who want change. Those who want a new beginning, those who want to surrender their heart to the Lord and also um, for the faith of the people of God. Okay. So if you're ready for change, hear this. The word of God declares that we are justified by faith and it is our confession which saves us. So the only thing that you need to do to qualify for the reward of eternal life is to simply confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So let me pray for you now. Dear God, meet this soul wherever it may be. Give them a new start, a new mind, a new name, a new outlook on life. Erase the guilt of their past, acquit them of their sin, their iniquity, and sanctify their heart that they may live for you. And God, for your people, I pray for their strength. I encourage my brother, my sister to hold on to the profession of their faith without wavering. In Jesus name. Amen. So until next time, God bless you and God keep you.